In this slide um, show the last uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, that relates to chapter 9.2.3 we're going to look at the way in which relevance theory uh, tries to explain the phenomena that we've looked at earlier with the kind of devices that um, we've mentioned. Um, before we do that there's a couple of other things that we need to talk about and the first is relevance theorists talk about propositions having explicatures. Uh, an explicature is something, uh, a propositional content that can receive truth conditional interpretation. Normally uh, sentences um, are not interpretable without pragmatic inference. There's too much missing as we've already seen. Utterances are interpretable because they're uttered in a context and the context, as we've also seen, is used for inferring a complete proposition which in turn can have truth conditions assigned to it. So we're able to infer who a particular person called John actually is uh, in context. Uh, a hearer can't decide um, whether the person left by train or not unless they infer who the particular John is that left by train. So an explicature is a proposition with truth conditions inferred on the basis of an utterance with relevant and inference made on the basis of the context in which the utterance was produced. So if we take this one, can you come and meet me? Let's suppose that I've been talking on the phone to um, my friend Ophelia and so we can now um, have a good guess at uh, who you might be. She's saying this to me. So she is Ophelia. Um, right? Me, the speaker, is Ophelia. You is uh, me, the person who's listening at my end of the phone. Can you come and meet me? All right, so what are the contextual assumptions? Me is Ophelia and Ophelia is coming tomorrow on the 4.30 by train from Milan. We've already talked about that. So she's discussed coming to see me and uh, uh, I'm expected to meet her. Well, she's asking. I live in Florence. So the explicature is, can I meet Ophelia at the end of her journey at 4.30 in Florence? Okay, so far so good. But uh, Relevance theorists also talk about there being further propositions which can be inferred on the basis of an explicature plus additional contextual assumptions. These are additional, of course, um, and they term them implicatures because uh, you can they're implied, if you like. Um, take the previous case. I can meet Ophelia in Florence at the end of her journey and on the 4.30 from Milan and the assumption trains arrive at railway stations. I mean she's not explicitly asked me to meet her at the railway station and it's perfectly explicable uh, in terms of an explicature that um, I meet her but uh, there's a further contextual assumption and that enables me to draw the further implicature that I can asking if I can meet her at the Florence Railway Station at 4.30. Yep. So the location of the meeting becomes part of an implicature coming from an additional contextual assumption. I'm not sure whether that's entirely correct, but it's very plausible. So let's see whether we can now do business with dictics and reference assignment and enrichment and disambiguation and irony, among other things. Okay, why do hearers follow the strategy of the first principle of relevance? That is, getting the most contextual effects for the least money, if you like. They'll try and extract uh, from the utterance the proposition which has the most cognitive effects for the least effort. And if an utterance contains a dictic like here, then uh, there has to be an inference as to where here might be because otherwise you can't give it a truth conditional interpretation. Here is the one which provides the hearer with the most relevant contextual effects, the one that adds the most to the hearer's cognitive environment with the least effort. So if 
we've been talking for a while and uh, I say Joanne will be here this afternoon here is the place the speaker and maybe the hearer are when the speaker is speaking and uh, this afternoon will be the afternoon of when I'm speaking yeah so all those two things the here and the afternoon are both dictics and they have to be interpreted in context to provide them with a physical here and an actual time of this afternoon what about reference assignment we've mentioned this repeatedly and if I say Joanne will be here this afternoon and we've been talking about uh, Joanne um, and we've mentioned which Joanne we've been talking about Joanne Smith we've been having a bit of a gossip so um, it takes less effort to, for me to suppose that um, Joanne is Joanne Smith because that's who we've been talking about not Joanne Brown who we both also know but we've not been talking about uh, her uh, there's no reason to suppose that if you uh, jump around a bit that one mightn't suppose it's Joanne Brown but we've been talking about Joanne Smith so it's less of an effort and more relevant if you like in relevance theory terms to suppose that we're talking about Joanne Smith what about enrichment uh, in chapter 8.1.2 we looked at and and the different ways in which and can be interpreted and then is an enrichment it's not part of the lexical meaning of and it's inferred from context so if there are two events they can be seen as being inferred as being linked causally or temporally and the contextual effects are more relevant in creating improvements to the hero's cognitive environment than not doing so so if we take uh, someone saying to us a truck crashed and the driver was injured uh, what sort of enrichment do we get there? We infer that the driver was the driver of the truck and uh, not some other driver. Now, the driver gives us a, a pretty good um, link back to the truck because we have a contextual assumption that trucks have drivers. We also infer that uh, the crash caused the driver to be injured. The truck crashed and therefore the driver was injured he was injured as a result of the crash but of course the sentence doesn't actually say so um, the utterance can be interpreted as saying so so the hearer infers the and therefore uh, connection uh, from the context what about disambiguation uh, we take it that speakers are being maximally relevant in what they produce in an utterance normally we'd expect them not to be ambiguous unless they're kind of clever and um, trying to be clever and known to be clever so as here is we use the context to remove the ambiguity to disambiguate the sentence so we've been talking about Adrian's studio um, Adrian's a friend of ours and we're talking about his studio and you say to me that um, you've seen Adrian's new picture and I infer that the picture is one she's painted. You haven't said that. You haven't said that Adrian painted the picture. You've just said that there is a new picture and it's Adrian's in some sense or other. Why? In the context, while it's possible that you're talking about a picture of her painted by someone else or that she's bought a new picture, it's um, um, more immediately inferable that she, being an artist, and we've talked about her studio, is the person who's painted the new picture it adds more to my cognitive environment to know that she not only has a studio but she's been painting in it recently what about irony why do we sometimes infer that the speaker means the opposite to what they say well that's because in particular contexts there are more cognitive effects and they're reached more easily you've just come to the market uh, there's a market just around the corner from us and on the weekend people go to the market and a lot of them come with their dogs okay you've come with your new dog and your new dog is a miniature Maltese all brushed up and washed and gorgeous 
and a neighbour um, who's walking along says where'd you get that huge beast well why do we suppose this is ironical and because it's manifestly at odds with the cognitive assumption that miniature Maltese dogs are large as dogs go they can't mean it's large because we've seen the Maltese it's tiny so where else do we go with this is the irony meant to be playful or hurtful or boastful well we need additional cognitive assumptions let's suppose that our neighbor has come along with a gigantic bull mastiff are they being boastful I've got a big dog you've only got a little dog well that depends on other cognitive assumptions what we which we can bring to bear and which will provide us with implicatures finally what about fiction from time to time in Cooper and Allen we've talked about fiction and used examples from fiction well we build worlds other than our own real world in our minds along with uh, cognitive assumptions about the world we live in relevance theory works exactly the same way for those worlds the worlds of fiction other possible worlds we create implicatures from utterances we create explicatures from utterances which we may read scenes we may see in movies these worlds are full of contextual assumptions held with various degrees of strength if you think of uh, if you a Star Wars nut um, as uh, I've mentioned in chapter 9 uh, there's a huge amount of knowledge you have about the world of Star Wars it's not the real world it's uh, entirely a fictional world it's come about through movies but if you start listing all the propositions that you know that is if you try mapping your cognitive environment for that particular world it's very large indeed we provide didactics with relevant locations and times we provide referring expressions like Han Solo with uh, uh, Han Solo as the referent uh, we disambiguate expressions in exactly the same way as we do in the real world.